Good evening, and thanks for joining us on Facebook Live as we discuss how a pancreas transplant can cure diabetes. I'm Dr. Peter Abrams, Director of Pancreas and Islet Cell Transplant at the MedStar Transplant uh, Institute, and I'm joined by Ms. Kiona McKnight, who is now living diabetes-free thanks to a pancreas transplant about three months ago. Today, Kiona will share her emotional journey and I will discuss the benefits of a pancreas transplant, who is a candidate for a transplant, and how a transplant can improve quality of life. If you have any questions during our discussion, please ask them in the comments. At MedStar Georgetown Transplant Institute, we have performed more than 400 pancreas transplants and over 5,000 kidney transplants, making us one of the busiest transplant centers in the country. We have been performing these procedures for quite some time with excellent outcomes and life-changing results. We will now hear from Kiona, who came to the Transplant Institute because of her diabetes and being on dialysis. Please, Kiona. Thank you, Dr. Abrams. Um, well, hello all. My story is one that's pretty unique and my journey started when I was 14 months old. On the day that they discovered I was type 1, my aunt, Dinah, actually was the one who, as of today, I thank her and am grateful for her because if it wasn't for her, noticing that I wasn't acting the right way and letting my grandmother and mother know how she felt the way I was acting and looked, that they wouldn't have took me to the hospital. On the day that that happened, um, she came to play with me like she did every morning, and she noticed that I wasn't sitting up, I wasn't jumping up to the side of my rail. Again, I was 14 months old. This was approximately two months and a week after my first birthday three weeks after Christmas, 1981. Um, it was January 1982. And on that day, my grandmother and mother, out of concern, what she was saying, and by the way I was looking, took me to Children's National Medical Center. At the time, it was located near the Shaw Howard um, community. Um, this is before the Children's Hospital we know of as now, um, on Michigan Avenue, Northwest. And once they arrived at the hospital, they were walking down the corridor. And another doctor was walking up the corridor, happened to look at me. And from that moment on, he instantly took me from my grandmother, directed them to the triage to register me, and whisked me in the back of the ER. I think mon moments later, they called Code Blue over the announcement. And another doctor came out and spoke to my family in regards to my situation. They told them, from what I understood, that I had 24 hours to live, that all the family members um, needed to be summoned up to the hospital because they weren't sure if I slipped into a coma that I would awaken. Because of that, um, that was the beginning of my journey. And later on, they learned that I had type 1 diabetes. And here I am. I survived the odds. I survived how they felt and predicted. And I overcame then as much as I just overcame now. And here I am. 13 weeks out from surgery, feeling great, looking great, having a whole new experience on life. During the past approximately about five years, um, I have life-altering changes, such as I started having kidney problems in 2013, January 2013. Spend approximately about two months, one month in Washington Hospital Center and one month in 
Georgetown University Hospital, at which in time I discovered that my kidneys were failing. Um, that was the beginning of my kidney disease. It wasn't until 2015 when my kidneys actually failed and I was introduced to a whole new procedure such as dialysis. In which time during 2015 and 2016 I happened to come to Georgetown University Hospital where the clinic, the transplant clinic, um, were super helpful, super advising far as what they felt I should be able to receive, um, what they thought would possibly help me. It wasn't until 2016, I believe it was June 2016, yeah. that I met Dr. Abrams. Um, this was a year after I actually started coming to Georgetown. And he had a whole new way of doing the pancreas kidney procedure and asked me was I interested in participating? Would that be something I would be interested in? And of course, at that moment, I was on dialysis for almost a whole year and um, I wanted to change. I wanted to live life better than what I was living. And so I say yes. It wasn't until just recently, this past year, um, that I actually had an opportunity to receive a pancreas kidney transplant. And my new life actually started August 28th here at Georgetown with the help of Dr. Abram, Dr. Gassinian, mm -hmm. Dr. Gilbert, and the, all, the whole staff and team at Georgetown University um, Hospital. And currently I'm doing fine, I'm doing well, I feel better. I'm very excited about my future and I'm just excited about life that I get to live. Um, growing up, I went through many challenges. I've been through so many different diagnoses due to the diabetes. I had many losses. Um, I consider all my trials and tribulations and ups and downs throughout that time my battles because it wasn't until four years ago that I actually started the war. And I was at war with myself. Unlike war as we all know war to be, going to other countries or defending our country, this war was me trying to fight for life, which I've done. And as of August 28th, I achieved, I won with the help of Georgetown Hospital Transplant Clinic and everybody that was placed in my life by God to help me achieve that goal. And I'm just ecstatic, I'm here. I'm happy to be able to talk to everyone that's listening, everybody who's tuning in and share my stories with y'all because it was a hard battle, a long battle. I've had diabetes 35 years, and as of now, I just celebrated a birthday November the 8th. I just turned 37 years old. Out of the first, well, I, I would say out of the last 35 years, I've known nothing but living life, surrounded by doctors, ERs, medications, and so, now free. Even though I gave up the insulin, and instead now I take pills, but I take a pill any day, then I have to go and relive a life with type 1 diabetes. And for everybody who's living life with type 1 or 2, to be able to sit here and tell you don't give up, to keep believing that you will make it, and do everything you possibly can, research, talk to doctors, inquire, 
if you're as passionate as I am about life, you would do whatever it takes to live. And I did that. And I am living proof that there are doctors such as Dr. Abrams and the whole staff, the whole doctor team, nursing team at Georgetown Hospital are coming up with some grand ideas to save our lives. Keone, your story is so compelling in, in so many different ways. One of the things that I wanted to mention about her, her war, as, as, you, as you described it, um, you were having problems with um, access, as I remember. Yes. Um, Kiona was on dialysis, but um, one of the things that you need in order to receive dialysis is a working um, artery and vein in one's body in order to get the, dia the dialysis to work. And her dialysis um, access surgeon, the person who was the person who uh, managed this access, if you will, in her body, uh, basically told her that she was down to her final access, that if this went down, dialysis was no longer going to be physically possible for her. So we were really dealing with um, some life and death stuff in that, you know, if she can no longer be dialyzed, um, you know, you, you can't sustain life. Um, and I believe that you were transplanted within a couple of weeks of actually being listed yes. for her kidney and pancreas transplant. Um, an option that we had thought about was perhaps doing a living donor kidney transplant first. We do a lot of living donor kidney transplants at Georgetown. However, in, in Kiona's case, there were not any potential living, uh, living donors that we knew about uh, that were coming forward uh, and as, as living donors for a kidney. Uh, and that certainly would have fixed or, or solved that problem with uh, access for dialysis. So one of um, the many benefits that we got out of listing her for a co combination pancreas kidney was she went straight to the top of, of the priority uh, list as far as getting the organs um, for transplant. And um, so I, I don't know if you want to speak to that a little bit, but you were really getting down to uh, a desperate situation as far as your dialysis access was concerned. Yes, I was. Um, between January, the end of January 2015, all the way up until more recent this year, um, right before my transplant, I had about 16 surgeries on my one access that they had availability to. 16. That was a lot. And my doctor over at Washington Hospital Center was like, you know, if it goes down again, he's not sure if he can get it to last. So it became very essential for me to receive um, the transplants. Um, and I didn't yeah. have a lot of time to spare. Yeah. And another aspect of Kiona's life, at which you know you're very modest about, and you don't like to talk about yourself that often, but is that she has you have several children, and um, they're young and they're running around all over the place like kids do. Yeah. Um, and, but you have had issues with your eyesight as a result of your long-standing diabetes. Yes. Uh, another um, benefit to uh, a pancreas transplant is that the diabetic disease in one's eyes calms down, abates, sometimes gets better, um, but certainly does not for, get any worse um, after the pancreas transplant, after the restoration of normal glucose metabolism. And so uh, Kiona now um, has all these children that she's taking care of. Now she can, you know, um, rely on her eyesight uh, to not get worse over time. So she doesn't have to worry about you know, um, you know, responsibility damages. for your kids and, you know, making sure you're around and being, you're able to see them yes. uh, as they grow up. Actually, um, yes, um, my eyesight had improved very well. Um, I've gained back some vision that I completely lost. Uh, that's one of the things I was saying. I had some lossage, and those are my battle wounds. Um, I had damage to all the nerves and muscles in my body. The muscles in my legs actually were so traumatically damaged, I developed a diagnosis called myonecrosis, which 
I lost the ability to be able to walk. And for a while, I wasn't able to stand without somebody else supporting me. Um, and with the diabetes being gone now, I don't have to worry about further damage. Mm. And some of the damages that was done actually um, was reversed um, in some ways, such as my eyesight. I actually, at one point in time, could not even see faces. Like, I can see Dr. Abrams' face clearly now. Versus months ago, I could, he looked like a shadow. And I only could see silhouette of people. Mm -hmm. And now I, I can see so much sharper, so much brighter. And I noticed that three days after the transplant, I just woke up and I noticed bright lights and edges of things. I could see the TV edges on the television that was hanging above my, my room. And it's just been so amazing. Things that I lost that I actually thought I would lose forever, some of it had came back to me. So you mentioned um, that you had, you know, you're taking pills now. Um, can you, like, sort of contrast, um, did you have, like, the difficulty that you may have um, had in controlling your glucoses before your pancreas transplant to maybe the challenges you have now for taking the pills that you take each day for your organ transplants? Now, since I was little, I always felt like a fish out of water. I would be so thirsty. And the more water it seemed I drank, the more thirsty I became. I have relatives and friends that will tell you I used to drink gallons of water, like, like in 20 minutes. Compare that then to now, like now, like the first thing I noticed after I woke up, like at midnight, I think I believe I woke up at midnight. I asked the nurse, did y'all do it? And she was like, yes, we did. I was like, you sure? I'm not hurting. I, I didn't have any discomfort, any pains afterwards in regards to the transplant. And the first thing I really noticed when I woke up and noticed, I wasn't thirsty. I didn't have that sensation to drink. Um, that was due to my pancreas immediately kicked in and mm -hmm. took over, and it was a quick turnaround. It really was. Beforehand, I'd taken insulin. I had been on insulin pumps. I've done it all. I was not only on insulin at one point in time. They had me on insulin and pills. And I still would go into DKA, which means ketoacidosis. And that's actually what I went into my first experiences when I was 14 months. Um, I went, it was called ketoacidosis. And from what I understood, that means that the glucose in your blood gets so high that it becomes toxic. And my body was becoming toxic to itself. That brings me back to why I say my body was going through battles when I was younger, but it actually went through the war as I became older. And again, I have scars and I have my legs which we're still working on, and I'm still hopeful that I can gain some use yeah. of them back eventually. Um, but I am blessed and happy and appreciate everything I have as of now with hope for more to come in the future. And type 1 diabetes was very hard, very hard. Um, I remember my endocrinologist at Children's telling my grandmother that I was a brittle diabetic, meaning that no matter what I ate, no matter how much I ate, my blood sugars were so sensitive to any type of sugars, good, good carbs, bad carbs, that it would fluctuate my blood sugars. I've had moments where I would go from 69, I've been as low as 33, and I've been as high as beyond 800. And do you ever, do you check? Do you once in a while check now that, that you have yeah. your pancreas transplant? And so far, I've been under hundred. I have not. I don't even think I've been a hundred recently. Um, the hundreds was when yeah. I was in the hospital the first few days. Yeah. I now stay between 
72 to 89. Yeah. And it's just so amazing because I got to a point when I was a teenager where I hated checking my blood sugar because I already knew. I learned to tell from my body mm -hmm. feelings when I was high, when I was low. I could feel myself dropping. Yeah. I could feel myself actually rising. I got so good by the age 20, I really didn't need a machine. I could literally predict mm -hmm. what my sugars were. And many times that I had to come into the hospital and come into the ER or a doctor visit, before they check it, I would tell the nurses, like, oh, I already know what it is. And I'm like, what is it then, if you know? And I would tell them, and it would be basically around that number I give, mm -hmm. not too far off from what I predict. And again, Type 1 is very difficult. It's nothing else compares to being a type 1 diabetic than any other type of diabetic. What about your energy levels? Can you compare your energy levels before your transplant to kind of how you feel on a daily basis now? Um, well, at, even in the beginning, I always was very fatigued. It, it always depend on how my blood sugars were, mm -hmm. was my energy level. If I had low blood sugars. I was very weak and lethargic. And it, at one point in time, my doctors thought that I was pretty much um, having seizures from my low blood sugars because my blood sugars used to drop so low. I remember one time I was in the hospital and they had to literally do um, what is it, cold blue? Mm -hmm. Had the people come in and they were ready to shock me back. They couldn't get my blood sugars to stay up. They just kept dropping. Yeah. But then hours later, once it came up, it went up too high. Right. And those feelings, it just makes your whole body feel like jello. You can't control nothing. It was when I was in my teenagehood when I thought that my, I can deal with the highs, which I did. I preferred my blood sugars high than low. Mm -hmm. Low, I couldn't control nothing. Highs, I felt better, even though my body didn't feel better. Mm -hmm. But I felt manageable. I can think. I can move. Just I was always thirsty. It felt like the fish out of water. My blood sugars during my 35 years of having it, um, my hemoglobin A1C, which is a reading of your blood sugars over like a period of time, such as three months to six months, um, had gotten as high as 17.8. And for years, it stayed on that level. Wow. And remarkably, I did okay until I made a ch I, I decided to make a change. I needed them lower. I had young kids at the time. My oldest probably was eight. My youngest probably was three. And I had to make changes because I wanted to be around to see my kids graduate. I wanted to be around to see grandchildren and participate in all their lives. And I had to change. But when I decided to change, I think I decided too late. Because when my blood sugar started coming down, it came, it got, I got it down to 11.1 .1 on my own. But then that's when the complications started to kick in. And from what I was told by my endocrinologist then, that diabetes is like a car. In the beginning, it might start off rocky because it's brand new. Your body's not used to it. If you maintenance it the right way, you'll be okay. <laughs> but the catch is, it's not a car, and right. it's not simple as that. Right. When you have diabetes, you can't, it pretty much controls you. It's no such thing as you controlling it. It's times where you can manage it and do your best, but over time, like a car, it tears down. It pretty much wanes and tear. It yeah. gets bad. And unlike a car, it's nothing else. You can't get another engine. You can't put in another tire. You can't put in the mechanics of a car. You only get one body, one life. And when things in your body start falling apart, 
only thing you can do is keep together what you have left. And it's so important that any diabetic try their best, but over time, like type 2s acquire theirs between 40 and 70. But with type 1s, we acquire ours pretty much at a young age. Mm -hmm. So the younger you are, the earlier your body starts to fall apart. Right. Such as a type 2, they probably won't feel the side effects of the wear and tear of their of diabetes until, they're, older, until right? they're maybe, depending on 40s, mm -hmm. probably 60s, mm -hmm. about 20 years later. Mm -hmm. With type 1s, we'll fill ours in our 20, late 20s, early 30s. Right. And on, it's just at that time when you start feeling it, you have to be proactive to try to figure out what can I do to change this. Unfortunately, it wasn't a lot of studies out during the time when I acquired mine in the 80s, mm -hmm. as it is now. And I say the children of today, type ones, they have better options yeah. than what I had. Yeah. I mean, we didn't even have machines. Yeah. My grandmother in the beginning used to have to use test strips out of a bottle and compare the numbers mm -hmm. to the side. They have a little chart, and the, based on the, num the color of your test strip is what the range it would fall in between. Right. I mean, the technology is definitely getting better every year, and thank goodness for that. Um, but as we've seen in your case, even with improving technology, there is still, unfortunately, a medical failure rate where the best technology, the best medicine, it still fails to adequately control one's diabetes, and by that I mean one's glucose levels. There are still, unfortunately... Um, a um, larger number of people than we would want who are out there suffering from difficult to control diabetes. And this is precisely the population of, of people that pancreas transplant is designed to help. We are not looking to find well-controlled diabetics with excellent qualities of life. We're not looking to do a big operation on people who are doing well. Um, we wish them well um, and continued uh, good health. Um, you know, pancreas transplant, as, and as you've lived it, is for that unfortunate uh, fraction of diabetics who still suffer. Um, and it really is only in that attempt, I think, by the medical community uh, when speaking with people like Kiona to really try to walk in their shoes for a mile or so to understand that people are not A1C levels, people are not fasting glucose levels, they're not one category or the other. They are people who day in and day out are constantly subjected to the chaos of highs and lows in their glucose levels. They're, they're constantly in and out of hospitals, ERs, doctor's appointments. Quality of life is quite poor not to mention the anxiety about when is my next low glucose level going to be? Am I going to detect it or am I just going to pass out and require someone else to revive me? It is these very difficult to control diabetics that pancreas transplant is meant for. Um, I, we have some questions um, and um, we're going to try to get to them now. Um, this uh, question is from Kevin. And the question is, how do we know if we are a candidate? It's a great question, Kevin. Um, sort of as I was just speaking to, um, diabetics who feel that despite the best efforts of themselves and their doctors are still not experiencing um, success with their management. In other words, they're still um, requiring hospitalizations. They're still... They still have progressive eye disease. They, might, they may be actually going blind. They might be legally blind already. Um, they are progressing to dialysis, or they're already on dialysis. Um, they are having some sort of severe complication from their diabetes that, despite best efforts, is not, um, not being addressed fully. Those are the type of patients that should seek out a transplant center um, 
for a pancreas transplant evaluation. Another question from Kevin. Can you please explain the procedure for pancreas transplant? I'd be happy to. This is the one thing you actually can't probably speak to, right, <laughs> since you were asleep. Um, a pancreas transplant actually involves um, the implantation of a second pancreas. A common misconception is that we take out one's native pancreas and replace it. No, in fact, we give you an additional pancreas. And the whole reason for that pancreas transplant are the insulin-producing cells within that transplant. So we hook it up very similar to the way a kidney transplant is hooked up in the pelvis of the recipient. And it's also hooked up to the uh, patient's intestine most often um, to drain the other, horm the other exocrine secretions of the pancreas. Um, so that uh, the, the pancreas functions normally. Um, the pancreas is not used as an adjunct for digestion. It is just used as a means of controlling one's difficult to control diabetes. Um, the actual procedure is done under general anesthesia. You're completely asleep. You'll have no memory of the operation. The operation itself takes about three hours to perform. If it's, if it's performed in combination with a kidney transplant, the entire simultaneous kidney and pancreas transplant takes about five hours to perform, uh, give or take an hour or so. Um, and um, you're typically in the hospital from anywhere from three or four days to about a week. If you're undergoing just a pancreas transplant, typically um, you're out of the hospital in three or four days. If you're in the hospital, if you're getting your transplant because you're also on dialysis and so you're receiving a simultaneous kidney pancreas transplant, typically it's about a week or so before we get you out of the hospital. The recovery time is rapid. You're up on your feet the next day. Your glucoses are normal even before you get out of the operating room. You, um, we check your glucoses because we want to make sure everything is functioning properly and um, if there's an intervention that needs to be done, we want to be on top of that. But um, by the time you're leaving the hospital, you are no longer checking your glucoses. You're eating, uh, you're sleeping without any anxiety about what your glucose levels are. So all of those test strips, all of that um, continuous glucose monitor monitoring technology, all of that um, goes by the wayside, fortunately. Um, Kiona, this is a question for you from Marianne. How was your recovery after your transplant? Um, my recovery was quick, actually. Um, I remember you told me that it would be 10 to 14 days. Mm -hmm. And I was a little worried about like 10 to 14 days in the hospital um, due to my kids. So I'm like, who is going to watch my kids for 10 to 14 days without me? Right. <laughs> um, so... But remarkably, everything fell into place as soon as it was done. And my ninth day, the doctors came in and was like, we really don't have no reason to keep you. Everything is, like, excellent, like, remarkably excellent. You can go home. You want to go home? I said, yes, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> and I was discharged maybe, I want to say, about 8 o'clock that night. I might have got home about 9 o'clock that evening. And my kids are actually shocked to see me, like, <laughs> this is like 10 days, 14 days. Yeah. Why are you here? I'm like, oh, wow. Hi, Mom. How you doing? You're home. Good. Thank you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> and they're like, no, we have you home, Mom. But we're shocked. And, and they and then, were shocked. And then you came to clinic, I think it's twice a week for the first week. Yes. I actually got discharged on a Wednesday. Wednesday. The surgery was done on the following, no, the two Mondays before. Um, and I started clinic the following Monday after that Wednesday I came home. And um, it was twice a week for, I believe, the first two, two three weeks. weeks. Yeah. yeah. And then it went to once a week. And I can happily say I'm on twice a week. I mean, uh, twice a month now. I go every other week. How about your pain? Any pain that you've exper experiencing from the incision or anything like that? No. Actually, like I said, I can't, for the first two or three days, I kind of asked my nurses, you sure y'all did it? <laughs> and they actually showed me my incision. And the great part about it, I thought I would be getting two cuts, two incisions, but I actually only got one. Right. And now it's completely healed, and it's, it's 
it's not like you don't even you really see it. And I got to say, remarkably, all my wounds, most of my wounds and scars from the needles, I've had three um, pick lines. I had um, multiple uh, IVs and all those scars that I had almost just about disappeared. It's and great. My recovery has been great. Like, um, this is a question from Lori. Lori asks, where does a pancreas kidney come from? So um, the organs come from highly selected uh, donors. Um, in the uh, United States, we have a legal definition of brain death, which is essentially a non-responsive uh, brain um, that occurs um, in people, unfortunately, for a multitude of different reasons. Um, we have learned um, through generations of experience with pancreas transplant that uh, the best pancreas transplant uh, outcomes uh, come from younger donors and donors that uh, typically are not um, overweight. So um, our program tries to identify um, young, um, non-overweight uh, donors across the country uh, when they become available and um, we, will, we will fly um, to different parts of the country to uh, procure these organs and bring them back to Washington, D.C. Um, and uh, we have local donors as well um, where um, we don't have to fly. Uh, but um, all of these organs come from uh, brain-dead um, donors. Um, we do not do uh, any living donor pancreas transplants at this time. Um, and uh, one of the re really critical aspects of success after pancreas transplant is being really um, careful about which uh, donor organs we accept. Um, we, we, you know, our litmus test, and this is a litmus test in many places across the country, so I by no means uh, mean to suggest that uh, we're uh, unique in this aspect, but we ask ourselves, would we put this... Um, organ into one of our family members and if the answer is yes then it, it uh, passes, uh, passes the critical test and then we move on to um, considering doing the transplant in, in our waitlisted patients. That's a really good question. Great, I think we have a, another question from uh, uh, someone for Kiona. Uh, the question is, was it weird not to have to check your blood uh, blood sugar anymore? Um, yes, <laughs> actually. Um, to be honest, I just, maybe three weeks ago, took my pin needles out of my purse. I used to carry my pin needles and the syringe tops with me everywhere I go, and I used to keep them in the most convenient place, in my pouch. And um, I finally, my daughter's like, Mom, why are you still rolling around with those things? And I, I finally decided to let go. In the beginning, I was a little nervous about leaving my diabetic supplies behind because, like, what if it, something happened and I might need it? So eventually, I overcame that. I still had the urge to oh, look at the clock and like, oh, is it time? Is it time? It's time. Oh, no, it's not time. I don't have to do that anymore. So it, it's a big transformation. You could say I went from caterpillar to butterfly and... I, it's a whole new world. It's, it really is. It's fantastic. So um, we wanted to transition, um, and more questions uh, the better from you guys, but we wanted to transition to some sort of um, frequently asked questions that um, we get all the time so that we could perhaps answer some questions um, for you out there. Um, so one of the basic questions is, uh, what are the benefits of a kidney pancreas transplant? So uh, people who come in on dialysis are looking to get off dialysis um, yesterday, right? No one wants to be on dialysis. Um, number one, it's a huge um, uh, imposition on one's quality of life. Life is terrible on dialysis for the vast majority of people. That's number one. Number two, it's really hard on that patient's family driving the person back and forth to dialysis three times a week or whatever it, whatever form of dialysis it is. It's a, it's a very serious medical imposition 
uh, not just the patient, but the patient's entire family. Um, and unfortunately, dialysis is a wonderful life-saving therapy, but it also um, does not prevent people from, unfortunately, passing away prematurely. Um, there's you know, very good evidence out there now that people on, on dialysis just simply don't live as long as they otherwise would in the absence of their kidney disease. So um, to get at the meat of the benefits of a kidney pancreas transplant, you get off dialysis because you get a kidney transplant and you get a very high quality kidney transplant from a relatively young donor. Um, and so there is an actual survival benefit to this type of, of transplant operation um, in that you're getting a very high quality uh, kidney with uh, immediate function. You're also getting, obviously, a pancreas transplant. That's why we're all here. You're being cured of your diabetes. And the, re the normal regulation of your glucose has a ripple effect downstream. So that kidney that you just got at the same time will not be injured in the same way that your native kidneys were injured by your diabetes, if that makes sense. So your glucoses will be normal, just like any other person without diabetes following your pancreas transplant. And so those wild fluctuations in glucose levels that occur in diabetes won't happen. And so the injury to the kidney transplant that would otherwise happen is prevented. So your kidney transplant is going to last a lot longer as a result of that. Um, another benefit of a simultaneous kidney pancreas transplant is that you're not going to have to wait the long period of time for your kidney transplant. The, uh, the average wait time for a pancreas transplant at Georgetown is less than a year. Um, the average wait time for a kidney transplant at Georgetown is almost six years. Uh, with certain blood groups um, or tough to transplant patients, it's longer than that. So you're talking about a dramatic reduction in the time that you actually have to wait for a kidney transplant by listing for a simultaneous kidney and pancreas transplant. Um, there, there are more um, benefits. There's quality of life benefits. Again, the anxiety over your glucose levels. When, when is the next time my glucose level is going to drop to a life-threatening level? That goes away. You can live a normal life. You can go on vacation. All of these things with quality of life are very important endpoints that um, that you know every single patient of ours talks about um, um, after after their successful pancreas transplant another frequently asked question is can patients with type 2 diabetes benefit the answer is yes in very carefully selected patients with type 2 diabetes their diabetes is cured in exactly the same way as patients with type 1 diabetes. Exactly the same way. Your glucose levels will be normal. You, you will come off insulin and experience a diabetes-free life. Another uh, question is, what is the quality of life for patients after transplant? Kiona got into to that a lot here. Um, but uh, the quality of life is much, much better. It's significantly better. It's a, it's a very important, and it's, we consider it one of the primary endpoints that we monitor in our patient population, quality of life being so much better. Uh, another question is, could I have a pancreas transplant for pancreas cancer? I get that a lot. I get that question very often. And the, um, the short answer is usually not. There are some benign uh, tumors of the pancreas that... Um, can be um, addressed through a near total uh, removal of your native pancreas, rendering you diabetic and therefore you're cancer free and you're now diabetic and you would therefore be considered a candidate for a pancreas transplant. These are very rare cases and is not the typical uh, patient that I see as a candidate for a pancreas transplant. Most of the time when people are asking about pancreas cancer, they're thinking of the standard sort of, um, un unfortunately, garden variety, horrible, devastating um, type of pancreas cancer that has very poor um, five-year survival rates. Uh, and unfortunately, those patients are not candidates for a pancreas transplant. 
the immunosuppression that uh, pancreas transplant patients receive after their transplant would actually make their odds of uh, living longer even worse than not getting a pancreas transplant um, at all. Um, another question is, do you remove the old organs when you do a transplant? This is something we talked about at the very beginning of our, of our broadcast, and the answer is we do not. We leave the native pancreas in your body functioning as far as your digestive um, system is concerned, functioning normally. Um, another question, where do the organs come from? As we talked about, they come from brain-dead donors. And the last question, are there any changes in immunosuppression uh, for a pancreas transplant compared to a kidney? We do, um, in the early stage, tend to run immunosuppression slightly higher in uh, uh, pancreas transplant patients compared to kidney transplant alone. However, most patients cannot um, detect any difference. Uh, there's, no, um, there's no increased rate of side effects based on the slightly increased rates of immunosuppression that we, we use in pancreas transplant. So um, I think it's time that we wrap up. We, uh, we really hope that you have enjoyed uh, tonight's Facebook Live discussion on curing diabetes with a pancreas transplant. Um, and uh, we encourage you to find out if you might be a candidate for a pancreas transplant, either um, here at MedStar Georgetown Transplant Institute or at any of the other fine pancreas transplant centers across, across the country. Um, we have six uh, convenient kidney pancreas transplant evaluation clinics throughout D.C., Maryland, and Virginia. And you can call 202-444-3700 or visit medstargeorgetown.org uh, to find out more. Again, our number is 202-444-3700. Uh, I want to thank Kiona for uh, coming and um, g giving um, her story. Um, it's always so compelling, and uh, I never grow tired of hearing about um, how happy you are now and how your, your family is doing well and, and just everything is better. So thank you so much for coming. I really appreciate sure. your time. Thank you. So thanks for watching, and have a good night.